ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by de facto shaving oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to ThatGreatBusinessShow.com, episode 9 of Ireland's best business podcast, recorded on the 19th of November 2020. On today's packed show, it's about location, location, location. A business that builds houses in Mayo and ships them to the US. A Dundalk business that was run from Saudi Arabia. An Irish company solving the world's parking problems. And pass this all, please, as seaweed burgers are coming to a burger joint near you. Yes, indeed, we do business differently. Now, growing our audience is vital to our business, so please tell your friends, family and business colleagues to subscribe to thatgreatbusinessshow.com. They can find us on all of the great podcast places like Apple and Spotify, and then they can have them. They can have myself and the Jamie lad always in Jamie their ears. Lad. That's exactly what I was going to say. I'm the, Jamie I'm the Jamie lad. Well, look at the size and the, <laughs> the, the youth. He is the former pro rugby player, entrepreneur, investor, podcaster, and also currently doing a very entertaining job as a TV rugby pundit, bringing us something called Jamie's Jewels. <laughs> what, are, what, are, what are Jamie's Jewels? I'm trying my best not to use that term, but uh, yeah, Jamie's Jewels are just asking a series of relatively quick fire questions at the end of the interview just to get a bit more insight and crack out of the fellas. Little nuggets, little diamonds. Jamie's Jules. Jules. See, see what it did there? Yep. Yeah. Anyway, you are also Jamie's words of wisdom. <laughs> oh, so what have you got for this week? You sound like you're surprised. Uh, yeah, I know, this, but this I'm just laughing nine. at it coming back to me. Uh, so this week's random word of wisdom um, was if, <laughs> okay, it's not sufficient to do things better. We need to do better things. Okay. Do you listen to yourself about these things or, you know, do you take them on board? Yeah. Or do you have one of those little random idiom makers? No. No, no. These are all from either people I listen to or read uh, or pick up somewhere along the way. I, I'm a big believer in osmosis, you know, just you keep throwing enough at your uh, at the wall and hopefully it'll <laughs> stick or seek in anyway. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> First up today, we have one of the world's great talkers. Donald Byrne is founder of Mayo-based Big Red Barn Company, a maker of modular homes. The company grew out of an idea Donald had when he was working on building sites in the UK ahead of the London Olympics. And since then, like all good businesses, the business has changed and grown. Pre-COVID, when there was a ploughing championship, Big Red Barn used to supply Lidl and many others with their stands, or more correctly, in Lidl's case, a supermarket on site. He's also constructed modular homes in Mayo and sent them to the US. He's offered to make a big dent in the homeless crisis using his instant homes. An offer that, for some reason, hasn't been taken up by government. Donald's motto is... He doesn't do problems, he only does solutions. Welcome to That Great Business Show, Donald. Cornell Jamie, thank you very much for having me. Donald, on, on that one, right? So, you started out in the Olympics, if I'm right, um, and you were doing events and, and helping put events. And I was over that London one, it was amazing. But obviously, a logistical nightmare. Um, where and how did you see kind of that blue ocean, that space for you to play in? And, and what were those kind of critical success factors that, you know, the people at the time weren't using? Okay, great question and a long answer to it. Um, <laughs> no, no, I've been warned about you, right? So keep it concise. <laughs> okay, I was the operations manager for an area in the Olympic Park called the Common Domain, which was 300 acres of all the ground between the venues. So each venue had a manager and then the Common Domain had a manager. So we tested the Olympic Park a year, year and a half before the Games to see the do's and don'ts. And during those tests, we had serious issues because we run them during the wintertime with um, temporary structures, marquees, and wind would come, lift them, blow them, rain would leak in, condensation and warm weather. So uh, when the Olympics were all over and the park was been handed back to the legacy company, I was one of the last guys left. I started to design the concept, came back to Ireland, got a prototype made, tested it for the Mayor's Common Hospice. I ran a few fundraisers, huge success, and it took off from there. And that was it? That was it. And so you started off seeing that um, event space. Uh, we were talking offline a little bit about this. Tell me how much of your business was when you started out in that space and how uh, has that changed to where you are now? 
Okay, so it's done a pure flip. At the start, we would have been 90% events, 10% manufacturing. Now we're 90% manufacturing, 10% events. And this year, it's 100% manufacturing due to COVID, no events. And we've been very lucky. Why did we change in that direction? Yeah. And you'd asked that question earlier. So imagine the plowing is over and the event season is over. All you've got left is maybe the beer festival and the Christmas markets. Very little. So we wanted that we had full-time employment. But also there was a need there. We launched a new product every single year. So the first year, the Big Red Barn. Second year was the Little White Chapel in line with the Yes Vote. Third year was uh, Europe's first two-storey modular structure. Fourth year was our first uh, modular home. Second year was the two-storey modular home. And last year was the tiny home. So every year we've tried to have a new product to keep in innovation. I'm, I'm, I need to give people a sense as well that Donald sat down here and before he even opened his mouth... <laughs> The brochures were out on the table and not just on the table, but out facing myself and Connell as if we'd walked into a showroom. This man is the born seller. <laughs> so I, before you jump in there, I have one more question, yeah. right? Because I'm fascinated about this, this space. I think, it's, I think it's really interesting. I think there's a lot of trends at play here that are going to potentially stick around. I'm curious on, did you, was there a trend that you were already seeing with people buying modular uh, homes, be them, you know, proper big ones that we were talking about that you need planning for or, or the smaller 400 foot ones that you don't need planning for. Was was there a trend there? And my second question, right, uh, yeah, sorry, you're going to have to write this down. <laughs> How, why are you, why are you producing every year a new product? Is that to maintain some sort of transient advantage or is that just your drive? Okay. To dance the first one, we'll go with the trend. Um, I was lucky enough to have been chosen by uh, our local enterprise office to be brought to the US on a trade mission. So would you be interested in bringing your model to the US? So our model at the start was mainly huge event structures, uh, temporary warehousing and modular home was sort of the, the smaller piece. Um, but when I got to the States and visited Pennsylvania, they had 33 factories making modular homes. So went to visit them and said, wow, and every home out there is modular. They don't build in blocks and mortar. And we very much had this concept in Ireland. So rather than the usual thing here of between the plan of permission and the building last in two years, in America it was all over in two months. So what? you went to a beautiful yard with 15 houses, walk through, picture house, picture colours. It went down the factory line, your house came out, bang. And I thought, yes, that is the model. Because if you look at here, apprenticeships when sorry, I was... Sorry, why, why is it like that in the States and not here? Are we just... It's like that, to be honest, in 80% all over the world. Ireland is just obsessed with concrete. Concrete built is better built. If you go to Scandinavia, Bear Ireland and England, very few homes are concrete built. So you got... Is concrete better? Well, you don't hear a pyrite in a, in a manufactured uh, factory home or in a modular home. You don't hear of rising damper or, or any of these things. Radon, you know, they're all existing in concrete. But it's a mindset... Tesla are going through the roof now and a few years ago everyone was laughing at them. Huh. It will be the exact same space in a few years' time. So, came back to Ireland, wondered, okay, would it work in Ireland as much if we put a put of a push with it and change people's minds and educate them? Let's look at the labour element. Nobody is doing apprenticeship now. But if you went back 10 years ago, everyone wanted to be a plaster and a block clear because there was great money in it. Now they have bad backs and they all want to work for Apple or Facebook. So we don't got these trades. So we're not going to have block clears and plasters in 10 years' time. How are we going to build all these houses? Do you know what the two of you are like? You're like two L fellas, and I'm the L fella here, given it, oh, people will no, will, won't do apprenticeships anymore. They all want to work for Facebook and all that kind of stuff. That's not true. true. It is true. <sighs> Can you name anyone that's doing a block clear and apprenticeship or a plastering and apprenticeship? I don't know them, but there must be. I certainly know electricians. Yes, but that's not a wet trade. And the electrician, again, it's lovely and dry and he's always the best looking one on the building site. <laughs> you know, everyone knows that. He's Every got the spark, he's going to absolutely love exactly, you. Yeah. <laughs> First thing he does, look in the fuse board, I'll be back in a week's time. You know, it's not the same. He doesn't get wet. So we got to move with the times. And we have a huge housing problem. Brendan Kinney was on Pat Kinney's News Talk yesterday. You should listen back to it if anyone's heard it. They are building houses that are costing a fortune. They cannot do it and they can't keep up the demand. Five to eight years it takes them to do a development plan. It's madness. You could, because you've told me before, solve the homeless problem or make a big fat dent into it. Yes, 100%. And I made presentations to Dublin City Council and they're coming with the same line. You have to go through the same tendering process. It must have a four-storey building, 50-year warranty. If you have a temporary problem, why do you need a permanent solution? 
when you have a temporary problem, introduce a temporary solution. So my pro- plan or proposal was take any of these greenfield sites they own across the city, plonk 100, 500 houses on it, put in uh, all two beds, three beds a variety, childcare facilities that's modular, a community centre that's modular, put everybody in it, get away the homeless crisis when you have permanent houses built and lovely developments, move them to it, take the development down and donate it throughout well, the my, that was my That was another question I had for you on these. So, so some of these units, so let me just take a step back. The, are all the units, what's the longevity on them? Out of so curiosity. They will last a lifetime if maintained. We give a 25-year structural warranty. So they're kept off the ground 12 inches. So you don't have the rising damp, you don't have the dry rot, you don't have the radon, you don't have the pyrite. That's why we can give a warranty. Okay. Okay. It is a fully kingspanned uh, insulated roof, the walls of 150 to 200 mil insulation. They're engineer certified, structurally certified. So if you buy an ordinary house, once the builder goes down the road, technically that's about it. While we're standing there, we have somebody out within 24 hours. We sell off reputation. Guaranteed if I put a house in your area, I will be back within 12 months with another house. And and so, so, I have two questions actually now, right? So you, you're given a 25 year warranty on these things, right? And, and it's just like a warranty on your own house, I suppose, to a certain degree. But you can you can sell on your house. You know, so what? How? I know this is new. How has the resale value gone on them, or or has that market even evolved yet? And then on your temporary structures, like events or or like the project you're talking about there. How reusable or recyclable are, are they? Just out of curiosity. Okay, very reusable. So let's just take the event industry side yeah. first. All our barns, where are they at the moment? Uh, DPD, that went through the roof, online parcels. So they need warehouses rapid pace, hadn't time to put in for planning permission. Hand sanitizer went through the roof. So they're out there now in factories making hand sanitizer. None of them are in my yard. So they've all been reused and I got the same resale price as what they were worth because they're not damaged in any way. They're a steel structure. Okay, and the housing element of it, we had... That two-story house at the National Ploughing Championships, took it down, put it up in Swinford, it's still there. Same with our show house in Galway and we resold it. Now, they're holding their value of what we built them at at the time because the cost is going up. And material, we'll just take, in the last month, Kingspan went up 11%, Timber got about 8 to 10%, same with steel. And come January when Brexit, we're talking maybe about 20%. So at the moment, resale has been brilliant because I haven't lost. But what it'll be in five years' time, it'll totally depend on the market. Yes, because it's, it's a new market. It's a- that that's a relatively new market, I'm guessing, for you. But I, sorry, I'm I'm very pro the space because then at the same time, I mean, what what's the average cost of one of these houses? Okay, so if you take the smaller unit, the unit that goes behind mom and dad's house, we call it the modular. Then we unit. kick mom and dad down. <laughs> down there after a few years, yeah. Go on, independent living. It's not a granny flat. You're talking forty thousand. Okay, the tiny home on wheels, thirty thousand. The A grade rated home that ticks all the planning regulations and looks like a standard home, one hundred and fifty thousand. So we have a house for everyone's budget. And to answer the question you asked a minute ago that leads into this, why a new product every year? Because there's been a need for it. So at the start, it was, okay, I want the one bed unit. Then it was, I want the family home. And last year it was, I don't have money for either of those, but I have 25 grand, the tiny home. And if you go on to Netflix and look up the tiny home movement, it's it's massive. And I never thought I'd sell one in Ireland and we have two on the way out before Christmas, which is just amazing. And are they additions to people's home or are they like a bit of land? They're like, let's stick it on so the land. I won't name the two customers, but yeah, yeah. They, before Christmas, it's a girl that came back from Australia, um, moved in with mum and dad, ready to kill mum and dad, decided before <laughs> Christmas is I want out. So she is down the back garden. She has her own space, but yet uh, less is more. Now there's a better relationship at home. Everyone has their own space and she's not in Australia. And it gives her a start wow. her home. So she saves the money for her mortgage. She now gets her 10%. And in five years when she gets her mortgage to build a house, hopefully belonging to us, she puts this in the back garden, sells it or else uses it. Airbnb, oh, yeah, yeah, home yeah. office. Wow. I think, it's, I, I think it's class. Two further questions. One is yeah, because Jamie doesn't know anything at all about the little white chapel. Is that still going? Yeah, so that was our second product. Oh, um, hold on a second now. He thinks I don't do the research or, or yeah, anything like that. Is that. You see, I right? know this lad so long that it's, uh, he's just a fascination I, 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 to I me. Thought, I thought, because I, I was reading it up and I thought the Little White Chapel was a bloody great idea, right? And really embracing modern Ireland, if I'm honest. But then when I saw you do, you do all the stuff around it. You get the bar license, you get all sorts of different licenses that you need, the insurance, you sort it all out. The whole package. Well, it's the same as what we did with the homes. We try and make it turnkey, that you don't have this awful experience of dealing with 
10 different subbies or event people and that it's just one person, one job and we get it done. So I got I won uh, Mayo's Best Young Entrepreneur in my second year in business and I used the prize money to build a little white chapel which was in time and in line with the yes vote. So again, these people now had uh, got it across the line but there was no place welcoming them for marriages bar a hotel room you had to rent and it's very business like yeah. so again after driving through Pennsylvania you got the beautiful red barns you got the modular homes but you got the little white chapels so we just took the same design we have for making Anthony modular popped it on the truck and we put them on the sides of the cliffs in Mullock Moor to um, uh, we had Google had their summer party down in, in Aylesbury Road and the Belvedere Rugby Club to have it in your backyard the shipping of houses to the States is the other question. I know COVID has done for that at the while. A lot of people just can't get their heads around the idea that you build in Mayo and then you ship it to, through Rhode Island. Uh, is, it was to Rhode Island, yeah, wasn't it? So, yeah, yeah. Pro, uh, Warwick was where the first home was in Rhode Island. Um, okay, very simple. The uh, American modular home, I describe it as a Wonder Bra house. It looks super, super sexy on the outside, but when you strip it back, there's not a lot behind it. And when you took back the walls, they use, for example, wool insulation, fiberglass wool, it's all timber, plywood. Ours is steel frame structure, very, very strong, durable. We have foil-backed um, insulation, okay? Uh, Kingspan roofs, so there's no uh, felt in the roof like you would have in America. America, you got a huge house, you cut it like a cake into four pieces and put it onto massive trucks and it goes down the road. They don't got narrow roads and ditches in America, so it's very possible. So that's why we're able to ship it. We can containerize the home and out it goes. Now, COVID hasn't helped us, but now with the Mayo man being elected in America, Joe Biden, <laughs> he's going <laughs> to he got have it. a special I saw, land. I already, I already thought of Muriel as well. That's up in Ballina, is it? <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, should Joe loves Ballina. Oh, he was back oh, as vice president. They're on first name terms. <laughs> they're on first name terms. You're as bad as Rob Carney for that one. You know that? <laughs> um, look, the American people are very, very positive. Mm. I've loved been over there. And every time you're over there, there's another town that wants you to move a factory there. And they had a brilliant thing that I visited in Saratoga, which is a trade school. So for the last two years of your secondary school level over there, for half the day, you go to trade school. So you do a bit of mechanic and a bit of carpentry, a bit of digger driving, and then you go to school for the second half of the day and learn your maths. And you have the option at the end to say, yeah, I'm going to be a steel fabricator. I'm going to be a carpenter. So they're very much uh, open-minded and problem solving while here we're very regiment and it is the way and that's the way it'll always be so that's why I've loved America and that's why it's working for us and hopefully when COVID gets out of the way it'll be back in action And how big are you planning on going because you're a big dreamer oh, We plan to take over we're not here for a short time we're here too. for a long time <laughs> uh, we, we, that was our plan so bear COVID last February I was out there just signed off on, on a permit for a home we were supposed to be going out with a neighbour it didn't happen so as soon as COVID is lifting and, and the American market stays strong we're back to the States Back to business And Ireland is brilliant but it's, it's still quite a small country and our friends across the pond, you know, they don't want to be friends anymore. That doesn't bother us at all. We put all our eggs in the American basket. We had too many of them in the UK basket. And I'm Congress. guessing you, you ship throughout the rest of Europe as well. And the UK. The UK is where we were massively. And we've done an awful lot of projects in Hinkley Nuclear Power Station. We've done temporary warehousing, um, temporary PSAs, VSAs. But when Brexit came, it, we, we didn't fancy the UK market and we preferred the U. S market. And what about the rest of what about Europe? What about the we rest haven't, of us? We haven't travelled mainly outside of, of uh, the UK. We haven't been over to France or anywhere yet. Um, I, I sweat a lot and it doesn't so, look good in shirts. So I, I'm trying something to tells me to the temperate climate. Something tells me a male man like yourself will have no bother with you know speaking a bit of uh, French or German or Spanish. You'd, you'd, you'd pick it up in no problem, no time. Joe Biden is going to be your salesman around the world now. There you go. Yeah, yeah, he'll do it for you. Excellent. But yeah. well, look, I can see it on the business card. <laughs> go big, with Joe. The big White House. <laughs> you should have the big White House. Now, that's one. I'm writing that one down. The big White House. Come on, come on. Oh, you have to have that. <laughs> yeah, I love that one. Listen, Donald, as usual, you're an entertainment and you are a fantastic at your business. So congratulations. Uh, you were going to say something? Gormi Lamagat. Yes, one last thing I'd just like to get across. On the first week of December, uh, we've joined up with St. Coleman's Credit Union because uh, they're the first to come to the party with uh, mortgages uh, for the two-storey modular home. And the reason is... You couldn't get mortgages? It was very slow. In the, the normal mortgage process is you put up the roof, they give you a payment. You uh, yeah. first fix wire it, they give you a payment while we land with a full house. So they found it hard to get their heads around it, the, the standard bank. While the credit unions 
do their own underwriting. So it's very much like the old way of doing banking, that where you knew the bank manager and you went in and told him your story and he went out and looked at your project. Yeah. Um, so we've teamed with them and we're doing a full open week the first week of December by appointment only for COVID, but you can contact us at info at bigredbarron.e or check us out on www.modularhomesireland.e, make an appointment, meet the credit union, meet our engineers, discuss planning, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get it all into one parcel for you. Well done. That is Donald Byrne of the Big Red Barn Company. And uh, I think Donald will pick up the phone to you, in fact, if you uh, ring there, because he does that kind of thing, I think. And from one great Mayo business to another, that's a great business show. Your business sanity clause between now and Christmas couldn't happen without the backing of that great shaving oil company, De Facto. Based on Mayo, you can buy their world-winning shaving oil online anytime at defactoshave.com. Incredibly, one bottle lasts over a year. Couldn't recommend it enough. No, Mr. Murphy, very, very well. And there'll be a bottle of all his products in our hamper this year that we send out to customers, which is filled with Mayo products. That was unrehearsed. I didn't know that. Donald, Griff Mila Magat. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Griff Mila Magat. Subscribe today to That Great Business Show on your favourite podcast platform, including Apple and Spotify. Listeners to thatgreatbusinessshow.com are very knowledgeable and they, of course, know that there is an award called the Global CEO Excellence Award 2020 Market Research Ireland. And today we have the winner of that award with us. Emma Hart is the boss at Dundalk County, County Louth based Customer Perceptions that has traded for 25 years and they have processed over 1.5 million customer inside reports. And listen to this, they manage 8,000 part-time field researchers, mystery shoppers worldwide from Dundalk. The award specifically relates to the company's new smartphone customer feedback technology developed over recent years. They call that Tell Us First, which makes sense. Uh, welcome to the Great Business Show, Emma. Thank you very much. Now, I know I'll forget to ask you this question because I said earlier on that you ran your business from Saudi Arabia. I was wrong. It was run from Bahrain. Yes, yes. Why were you running your business in Dundalk from Bahrain? Um, well, to give you a very short answer, it was because my husband, <laughs> he, he moved to Saudi and um, he did that for a few years. And at that time, I had a six week old baby and he asked me on the hop, oh, is that OK? I said, yeah, go for on it. The hop. <laughs> yeah, on the hop. Literally, I will never forget it. Like, well, I like was, just impa- had a cup of tea. Here, yeah, thanks for going yeah, there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said uh, he'd met an old boss of his and he said, I said, yeah, look, sure, it can't be that difficult. Three kids. Yeah, we can do this. So, um, sorry, three kids, three kids and, and a business. Yeah. And a business. Your business. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so he headed off and then all hell broke loose, really, I suppose. Um, so we did it for a year and, you know, it wasn't fair in the kids, I suppose, you know, and so on, and particularly the youngest. So we said we'd never, you know, we'd never get the opportunity again. The kids were young enough to move to school over there. So why not? So we gave it a shot. Had a oh, so you did a year where he went there and... Yeah, and I was I was back here in ah, Ireland. Ah, okay, yeah. And uh, so he missed out on all of that kind of non-sleep and so on and so forth. And um, so moved out there and yeah, it was a two over two years and I must say I had a fantastic time. Learned a lot. I think for the business, it was actually the best thing that could have ever happened. The business uh, for me personally Why? and for the business. Um, I suppose, it, you know, it forced me to... Um, not step back, but I was the linchpin and I had to organise the business that it could operate. And I think, as I mentioned to you on the phone, I took a bit of an ego dent then when I came back and they were doing a fantastic job. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, I gave me great faith in the team. They're amazing. And so I'd link in with them every day for a couple of hours. We'd work on different projects and so on. But they ran the show. Like, And I mean, they did a super job. You better tell the world what the show is. What the show is. <laughs> so Customer Perceptions is a consistent consumer market research business. Um, Our bread and butter would be mystery shopping, customer satisfaction, focus groups, um, really anywhere there's a customer engagement we can measure it. Um, in more recent times, I suppose it's a lot of COVID compliance. So we work with a lot of uh, Aldi, Lidl, um, Post, where you're actually going in measuring, um, you know, COVID compliance, social distancing. Um, uh, how, do, how do you do that? Do you, you don't go around wearing dark glasses and, you know, the slouch hat down and say, I'm a mystery shopper. 
No. What do you do? Um, so we have about 8,000 uh, field researchers around it's the country. A lot. It's a lot, yeah. And I mean, I often kind of think back over the time when I first started coming up in 19 years ago at this stage. Um, and it was only supposed to be for four weeks. <laughs> I ended up staying with them 19 years later. It is a family business. It is family business, yeah. I was actually, my sister was my boss at the time. Um, and she said, oh, come on in for four weeks. And uh, here I am it, that that much longer. Um, but we had 250 people on a, an Excel sheet and most of them we were, we were related to. Huh. Um, so we were in Dundalk, all my family like, are. like that up in Dundalk, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Cork and all my family are from Cork. So we had a widespread and uh, and then, yeah, roll on um, 8,000 people later. So that was really more driven by the clients because, like you mentioned, you don't want people going in with the white flag or the yeah. dark glasses. Recognition, um, uh, continuous fresh opinions, different profiles. So we'd have a lot of blockouts. So when we set up a project with the client, they'd say, we just want one person, one time you know, move on or you could get, we, we want a particular profile, say if it's within a bank, they might want to see a mortgage go from the start to the finish. And um, you have to find a person who's kind of pretending yeah, to yeah. buy so a it, mortgage or to it, get a mortgage. It benefits us to keep the base really, really big. We churn about, you know, things have slowed down obviously in recent months, yeah. but it, we would churn about 450, 450 to 500 CVs every month. So literally we're taking in and then people fall off and you know people kind of use it to supplement their income yeah, yeah. it's not like you know and I'm saying that there are mystery shoppers who do this as a career and they'd work for loads of companies you know a lot of people in sales who'd be on the road it suits them you know they might have an hour to spare before well, they the can appointment they can yeah. double job yeah ah, <laughs> so, I love finding out about people's little side hustles as they are called yeah. so, um, so yeah they, I mean you could have people travelling from Dublin to Cork you know during the week and they'll say I'll pick up ABC jobs along the way down Jeez, hold on, let me write the details <laughs> of this right <laughs> so um, so yeah so that's why the base sounds large but there's a logic behind it yeah you also are international in a big way yeah, we certainly are. So the we work a lot with Northern Ireland on the consumer research side, but on my I suppose my other hat is Optimum Results, which is the the pairing company, um, and that's training and consultancy. So we would do a lot in the Middle East, um, Eastern Europe on the training side. Um, there's been some crossover. In fact, COVID has brought up some opportunities, and um, so we've actually just got our first client uh, for Tell Us First in Riyadh. Fantastic. which is a driving school, um, a driving instruction school, and they want to assess their uh, drivers, the instructions. Oh, so, so do, it, it's, is it kind of like the secret shopper, except done internally, but it's not secret. And you give that, it's that feedback loop system, is it? Exactly. Well, this isn't mystery shopping. Tell us first is just assessing customer, getting customer to give you feedback. So uh, tell us first is, is, is as it, the name said, is, tell us first about what the experience is uh-huh. before you go and you tell anyone else. So as you can imagine, and particularly now where retail, I mean, online mm. sales have gone through the roof, um, there, you know, there's so little opportunity to 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 kind of suppose turn a dissatisfied customer into a satisfied one, particularly when you don't have that face to face engagement. So what Tell Us First is all about is if there's a problem, we tell us first. Don't go on social media. Don't go on TripAdvisor. <laughs> yeah. Let us fix it first. And you know, nine times out of ten, you absolutely swing the dial um, from a dissatisfied customer into a positive one. So, so taking um, taking a step back. You um, pre-COVID, mm-hmm. what are the kind of insights you were interesting insights? I suppose that you were you were seeing and, and interesting trends. And then the flip side of that, what are the insights that you're seeing, kind of on a macro level across the? Mo- I mean, your 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 client book is amazing. You know, across the different industries. Yeah, so I suppose pre-COVID, when everything was going so smoothly. (laughs) It just seems like another time. (laughs) I know, I know. Where does the time go? Um, You know, quite often this this subject comes up and a lot of clients, when we will go and meet them, they ask 
exactly what you've asked. Tell us what's the secret ingredient or what is the research telling us? And everyone knows what the answer is. It tends to be common courtesy, you know, a smile or acknowledgement, a thank you. Um, I was listening to your podcast actually coming down in the car, Dr. Joe, and she mentioned about (laughs) gratitude. And that's, that's what the secret ingredient is. I mean, I think now the challenge is we're wearing masks. It's like get in, get out. You know, how do you get that engagement back, that personalised returning customer? You know, you know, nine times out of 10 people will return based on the experience they've had, not necessarily the price or... Is that um, the same for um, online experience as opposed to... Real. Well, this experience. is this is the challenge. I mean, particularly in COVID times now, is how do you get that personal experience into such a kind of you know an experience where there is no customer engagement? Um, and I think the biggest problem that companies are going to have is living up to the what they're saying. So, for instance, you know, Christmas. Uh, sales. I'm sure I, before I left the office today, I'd heard Amazon had crashed because of P, our PS4 consoles. Oh, you yeah. know, how do, how do you fix that? You know, how, do you just do a blanket apology out to your customers? Or, um, you know, if you can imagine a small retailer and that happens, how do you how do you get back the confidence of the customers? Um, I was on a, an online um, with a retailer recently and they had amazing reviews, um, amazing comments on their customer service. You know, no problem if you want to return. Um, There's someone at the end of the phone and so on and so forth. You ring the number and, you know, you're put through to halfway around the world and you're on hold and your phone bill is clocking up. And, And I think that's where the opportunity is, particularly for Irish retailers, is you know, buy from us, deal with us. You're going to get straight to, to, yeah. to you know, to, to the business. Um, and you start to create, that, I think, that rapport. And but it you, is a challenge. Do you, do you get to deal with, again, when I was doing the research here, Connell, I was doing the research. <laughs> um, I write it. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, yeah. Um, your, your, your portfolio is amazing, right? But you're across so many different industries, but a lot of them you're kind of going, wow, these are serious names, okay? Yeah, yeah. But do you work with the smaller companies? Do you, everyone of every type of size? Yeah, uh, I mean, that's how we started. I mean, customer percep- perceptions evolved out of Optimum Results and where it came from was Optimum Results was, is a traditional SME business. Yeah. That's was their, you know, their market was small businesses. And a lot of where the idea, Aidan Hart, my father, I suppose where the idea came from originally was that, you know, small business is trying to get finance. The first thing the bank manager is going to say, have you done your market research? And, you know, that's quite intimidating for maybe a small business. Um, you know, do I have to go to the big players? I'm going to spend thousands. And and that's how customer perception started, was simply doing research on P- SME's competitors, sending customers in, what are they doing? How are they priced? Wh- you know, what are their systems? And that's what we grew from. Um, so, oh no, I mean, small businesses are very much part of our... Of our and on that, now that you've raised the issue, ball, roundest of round figures... What kind of money would that cost a small business to get that kind of uh, fin- preparing a report for a finance house or for a bank or whatever? For, for a, like, let's say a, a small re- yeah. restaurant, yeah. for instance. Um, so usually you'd agree it always depends on volume and frequency. Of course. But a small, like a small rest- a restaurant, it could be, you know, 50, 75 euros to get a mystery shop done. Yeah, that's plus your expenses. So they'd obviously have to pay for the meal. Um, and uh, then we agree what that is. Is it? You know, and is there a report or, after that? So they get a report and everything we do then is online through our, our, our own uh, platform. So like for a couple of hundred euro, you're in there. Oh, I mean, it's solid, solid research. It's independent. It's No, I appreciate all of that. Yeah. But I, I, um, what I'm hearing you're, you're, you're is it's very, very good value. Yeah. Very. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, you know, I suppose going back to your question earlier about, you know, what are the key? In, and I was saying, oh, you know, it, it's, it's it's the normal stuff. You know, it's the stuff you expect. But it's funny. It's, it's, it's so often... It's the stuff that's glaringly obvious that's overlooked. Yeah, well, isn't it? But the, the, isn't that what business is about? Is if you do it properly, do it right all the time, yeah. it all works. Now, the one I hate about uh, online is they're now using robots. 
bots yeah. to answer questions. I mean, it's actually insulting. Yeah. And you know it's a bot because they almost, they tell you now yeah. you're being responded to by a bot. Yeah. Go yeah. away, bot. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's me just giving it. You were going to say. It's more, more <laughs> it's infuriating forgotten. if they tell you they'll call you or, and then you don't get the call. Yeah. No, but my, my question was, so you're doing all this cool research, right? So you must have some insight um, what businesses to get into. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'd be curious, if you were setting up a business now with the knowledge that you know, you don't have to give any trade secrets away, but give some trade secrets away <laughs> and tell us, well, what would you do out of curiosity? Well, do you know what my next be- business idea is going to be? <laughs> is face masks that don't take off your makeup. <laughs> you were looking for one of those as well. Oh, <laughs> very good. Very good. <laughs> but, you know, going back to, to the obvious, even if you take the restaurant, I mean, I say like some of the businesses that we work with and they're saying, you know, what can you recommend? Or, you know, here's our all our mystery shopping and here's what all the customers have recommended. Mm. And so often, you know, businesses don't ask their customers, what do you think of us? You know, what can you do? If you take the restaurant, you know, the waitress or the waiter comes and takes your plate of half eaten food and doesn't ask it, can you please tell us what was wrong with that meal? You know, we'd, we'd love to know. And it's just a simple question and you could sort out so many problems. Hey, curious, is it, is it, so in our, in our pubs and restaurants, we, we actually use a combination of people coming in that we don't know. Now, this is more to keep an eye on staff and procedures because it's cash business. Things could go yeah. walking and it's yeah. more to see that those procedures are in place. But um, we always ask for feedback. But sometimes... I go into a restaurant and they never ask yeah. for feedback. Or I think we've all been guilty of it at a time where you have a meal, it's grand. They ask you about it and you go, oh, that was lovely. Yeah. Right. And you never give them the honest feedback. Yeah. And um, do you think, because you're across loads of different countries, do you think that's an Irish thing or is it something we're getting better at? Or is it a thing people are, are just like that? Yeah. Well, I, I certainly do think it's an Irish thing. I think even if you are asked and you're, you're after going to your, whoever you're having the meal with, oh, this is terrible or whatever, <laughs> yeah, then they come and they say, oh, yeah, no, it's fine, grand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but fine um, and grand are two words yeah, that you know. That you should know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I suppose that's where Tell Us First um, comes into it yeah. for me is because our, people aren't comfortable tending to give bad news to people. Mm. So with Tell Us First, it's it's, it's anonymous. It's um, they can leave the feedback. So, say if you get your receipt, it's a URL or you know QR code or whatever at the end of the receipt, and you tend to find people will leave the feedback when oh. they've left. So, again, going back to that second chance before they go on TripAdvisor and start, you know, doing all the damage. Yeah. The um, you know the owner is still getting that valuable feedback. Um, and where Tell Us First, I suppose, has a unique difference to its competitors is that we would often ask if if the the customer to leave their contact details so it gives the owner of the business that opportunity to pick up the phone they're really sorry this happened it doesn't have to be a monetary thing it could literally be just saying really appreciate the feedback Um, and we've had so many powerful examples Mm. of where that just simple telephone call has turned that dissatisfied customer into into it's it's funny I literally um, I'm doing an executive MBA and today I was doing an evidence evidence based uh, research it's called and it was all about um, the power of doing things remotely and how that takes a lot of bias out of the situation uh, sorry it's just hitting yeah, home off the yeah. back of what you're saying because yeah. people be a little He's bit more honest you, you'll write his, uh, his <laughs> essays for us <laughs> <laughs> please actually yeah <laughs> quick question on Riyadh because you just said that you've oh, you've got a contract there. yes how did you get a, uh, a contract in Riyadh well again it would have been through um, IDI so Optimum Results would do a lot of work with IDI who is IDI so they are actually a division of the IDA um, a kind of a, a splinter group that it's a private organisation IDI and they're based down there um, where they source different um, businesses or different people with different skills and pool them together depending on the project so it could be retail it could be construction it, they'll source the people for that project. Um, so Optimum Results was brought down to deliver a line management course down there. And one of the people on that course was this fabulous um, Saudi lady called Maha. And uh, she had set up her own mystery shopping business. So Aidan came back to and said, look, it might be worth having a chat. 
and we've partnered up on this ah, project. Yeah, amazing. happy days. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully to start something, yeah. something to come. Yeah. Which very neatly brings me to the future. What is the future? You've already won this big, uh, big award, Global CEO Excellence Award. Uh, I, I was, when I was reading that award, by the way, it was like, it was like anything. You kind of go, w- was it a bit of a like gradually then suddenly moment for you in terms of getting recognition like that, but I haven't the business been around for so long? Well, that's it. I mean, the business has been, I think they gave it to us just because we survived. <laughs> <laughs> but no, honestly, I th- and, and that's what it, do, it does come down to. I mean, it's based on, you know, your your finances, you know, the way you've organised the business and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, how, I suppose how the business has grown. Um, but I know my name is is on the award, but it is it, it, the work of the entire, the entire oh, team. She's a team player. But well, she yeah. did say at the start that she was almost <laughs> redundant. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but but, humble, humble. You know, but I mean, the future, I mean, what I really want to achieve now for the next few years is to get Tevis first on the map. Um, you know, that's the one that we can, we can take across the world. Yeah. And can Team GBS, our listeners, can they help you? What would you like them to do? Well, I mean, if there is, if there are businesses out there who are who don't have a customer engagement tool, they really are missing a trick, mm. um, because you know that is the answer to a lot of problems. Um, you know, structure, staffing. Your customers are a wealth of knowledge about how you can improve, and it's a very, very cost-effective, contactless <laughs> um, system that can be set up like in minutes, really. That um, sounds good to me, Emma. That is Emma Hart. And, uh, and, and and just on the note of being grateful, we have to say thank you very much, Emma, <laughs> for bringing in celebrations for any guest who's ever coming in. This is the quickest and fastest way to win us over. You're very and welcome. it's uh, starting Speaking to Speaking of debate. quick and fast, they're all gone because Jay Heaslip has actually munched his way through I had a double training session today, so uh, <laughs> I need to get the energy in. You'll have to go running for a bit longer now tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that is Emma Hart and she be of Customer Perceptions based in Dundalk, County Louth, and she will take your phone call directly herself if you want to do a bit of business with her. Emma, thank you so much. And thank you both. Thank, thank you, you, Emma. Thanks very much. It's all go at Quirsy Gno on thatgreatbusinessshow.com. Thatgreatbusinessshow.com brings you the best hacks, insights and business tips every week, all for free. Thanks to our sponsor, Mayo-based De Facto Shaving Oil. Their all-natural shaving oil is easily the best in the world due to its superior viscosity. And if you want to know more about viscosity, you'll have to talk to engineer Jamie. Superior viscosity is one of his pet subjects. Meanwhile, De Facto <laughs> backs us, so we ask you, Team GPS, to back them by buying De Facto online at defactoshave.com. That's great business show. Now, like all good businesses, we're being highly productive with our next interview by covering two topics with one guest. Dahi De Butler is CMO with Dublin-based Park Office. He's just written a 42-page booklet about the future of commuting, whether we'll ever waste hours and hours and hours of our lives sitting in traffic ever again and what that might mean for all aspects of the economy. But we also want to talk briefly to him about the Irish language in business, but I'll get to that in a while. Dahi, commute no more. Discuss. Give us the executive summary. Yeah, so I suppose at the moment, obviously, you have large amounts of people who are kind of working from home. Look at all the kind of research that's out there and a a lot of people are enjoying it. Um, And I I think that's fantastic. I think that's something that's going to be here um, moving forward. But I think what most people recognize and and realize is we are going to move towards a a blended working model. So that will be working a couple of days a week from home, but also a couple of days a week from the office. And so ultimately, that means commutes are going to return. And so we spent... um, um, around six weeks talking to 15 um, experts from around the world and, and really asking them w- what that future is going to kind of look like. Um, and I suppose short, medium and long term is, is going to look quite different. In the short term, we're going to see less public transport. We're going to see more cars and um, we're going to see more e-bikes and um, less carpooling. Uh, in the long term, we are going to see more cycling, more e-bikes and uh, we are still always going to see cars, but there's probably going to be less of a volume of them. 
Um, and then public transport is probably the one that there's biggest question marks on. Um, will it be needed to the same extent if we're not bringing the same volume of people into urban centres every day? Are you referring here to Dublin or to Ireland? Global, global. global. But yeah. hang on a second, but e-bikes, e-bikes in some of the big American cities, for example, that ain't going to happen. Why? Because it's too hot and the streetscapes are not made for cycling. Well, I think what you have to look at there is e-bikes, what they tell you is that their, um, I suppose, optimum journey length is four to eight kilometres, right? Um, and I would think that if you've ever been on an e-bike, you don't exactly have to work that hard, Connor, like, you know. So I think that you, you'll still be able to scoot around San Fran in the heat, let the motor do the work for you. And um, if it's a choice between, you know, an e-bike getting you to work in 15, 20 minutes or sitting in a car or sitting in a car for 45, paying three tolls, paying tax, parking taxes, you know, all sorts of things. When you look at transport around the world, it's very interesting. And um, like in the States, we're probably a good bit ahead of the rest of the world. You have transport quotas. So let's say you're a big employer in Silicon Valley. You sit down with the local council at the start of every year or every two, three year period. And you agree how many people are going to cycle, how many people are going to drive, how many people are going to take scooters. And then you have to show them on a regular basis that you're delivering on that. Otherwise, you get fined and fined heavy. And so we're going to see stuff like that coming in all across the world. So we're going to see... With businesses or county, sorry, so businesses are going to see with their local county council or whatever yeah. that they're going to incentivize them, incentivize them to make their staff or incentivize their staff to use multiple forms. And if they don't hit those quotas, they're going to find them. Is that, is so that, that what's that, happening? That's, that's what's happening in the States. Yeah, it's called transport demand management. Um, so it's been on the go for around 20 years, but it's really starting to, to blossom. And if you looked at all the big tech companies now in places like Silicon Valley, they would have in-house transport demand teams. So they'd have five, six, seven, eight people whose sole jobs are to manage how people get in and out of the office every day. So, how, But how, how do they incentivize them? Is that, like, you know what I mean? Because if someone... If someone wants to drive their car, they'll drive their car. If someone wants to use an e-bike, they'll use... You know what I mean? Like, so... Yeah, so I suppose, like, there's softer and harder things that can be done, yeah. right? So let's take parking, for example, right? So if you know you have a parking space every day, you probably will drive. If you're told you only have parking three times a week, then will you drive five days or will you maybe take the bus two days and drive the three days. If you're told you have to pay for parking on site every day, um, are you going to drive at all? You know, so there's lots of different measures, stuff to do, stuff around cycling. It might be as simple as like they have on site bike maintenance workshops for people because the lad who has the bike out in the shed and doesn't know how to change his flat tyre. Like these are some of the barriers you're looking at, mm. you know. So um, there's a whole range um, of activities and, and things that people are doing across carpooling, parking, car sharing, bike sharing, e-bikes, scooters, the works, you know. Mm. You should explain that this is your business. This is what you do for a living. Yeah. So um, I suppose I work for, for an Irish company called Park Office. Um, so we're the number one employee parking management software in the world. Uh, we work with some of the biggest companies in the world and um, helping them, I suppose, manage how employees park at work. And the sort of, of things we would see is we have companies coming to us who say we currently have, you know, 50 parking spaces and 100 staff. How can we make this work? And, and we kind of have a, a hot desking for parking spaces style solution mm. to figure out who's going to be in when and who gets what. And um, But we've also seen what's coming down the tracks and we have added additional features which are very popular in the States and, and will become more popular to help people reduce the amount of parking that they want at work. And this is very pertinent in COVID at times mm. and because we now I would think every leadership team in the world is having a conversation at the moment on office space and do we need the same amount of office space moving forward but what's really interesting is in the states there's actually more employee parking square footage than there is office square footage right so everyone who's having a conversation about do we need to keep three floors of the office or are we okay to go to two also needs to have a conversation around car park nice. space. Um, but at the moment, unlike with your office where you have certain data points around how many people are coming in and out of the office every day and all that sort of stuff, no one has a clue what's happening in their car park, right? No one has the data or the insights um, to underpin that decision making. So what we're able to do is we're able to tell people, okay, well, on a Tuesday, your average Tuesday of 120 people, on an average Wednesday of 130, yeah. you have 
currently have 250 spaces there so you can actually cut that in half and um, so what we're kind of doing really is is I suppose we're, we're giving people um, the the software to, to fully manage their parking both in the short term around demand but also in the long term about making the strategic decisions they need to make which are good for their company and for the environment. You you, you opened up with some trends and you, you touched on it there again. What are your the kind of top three trends that you're seeing in this space that your company is let's say leaning into a bit more? Yeah so I think 2021 is, is going to be very interesting. So for I think COVID has had a massive impact. So traditionally, hierarchical companies are probably the worst for pa- managing parking. I, I'm a partner in a big law firm. I get my parking space and I'm not going to be tippy tapping around with no app. To, <laughs> and to I want tra- it right beside the door. And- <laughs> All this sort <laughs> yeah. of jazz, right? Um, but now if you're a partner in a big law firm who's working from home three days a week, can you really justify that they're spending three grand for you to have that kind of parking space. So I think that kind of the newfound flexibility around work is going to instigate a lot of change around travel. So I think that that as people come back to the office and just in the same way that when we started work from home, there was Zoom and Slack and all these new tools. I think when we return to the office, there's going to be a whole host of new tools and solutions. I think transport is is going to be a key part of that. Actually, just just on that kind of topic, what do you think... um, company's sustainability strategy will, or environmental strategy, whichever term you want to use, will come into this fray as well in terms of reducing down what they are depending on. Because we touched on e-bikes, for example, or using public transport as opposed to driving your car in. You know what I mean? Um, Do you think that will affect these policies or strategies? So what's very interesting is is definitely there are are companies who think like that. And Mm. we would have a lot of companies who come to us and would say, we're worried about the environment and we want to do our bit. So how can we incentivize our staff to travel more responsibly? And um, by and large, that isn't their main reason for purchasing at the moment. Um, very much at the moment, and this would be pre-COVID, um, particularly outside of the States, it was still we've 250 staff and we've only 150 spaces. Okay. How can we make this work? Now, what we see in the States is as legislation starts to come in um, and as these have to agree the transport quotas, that's when the environment really becomes um, part of it. So for some companies, carrot does work, but I would think for it to go mainstream, we're going to need to see a little more stick. This all means curtains for car parks. I wouldn't think it's ever going to mean curtains for car parks. I would say... Is the era of 90% of your staff driving to work and parking five days a week, is that coming to a close? I definitely think it is. I think that, you know, you're always going to have certain staff who need to drive in the odd day because they have to get away to a parent-teacher meeting or they have to go to the young lads GA training after after work or whatever. Um, And I think having um, a certain amount of space to manage what pops up with life um, is very important, particularly if your target employee demographic um, has family um, or can't afford to live close to your your place of work. Um, But I would think we are going to see massive shifts. And I would think that I don't think that I will in 20, 30 years time find too many companies where people are parking five days a week. But I think that there will be a lot of companies who have a thousand employees and a hundred spaces, you have a couple of, you have five credits a month and you're allowed to, you're allowed to park five times a month because things pop up and sometimes you just need a car. So I, I actually, a very interesting question to you now, Jamie, go on. is if you were in that situation, because it just struck me, if you were given five credits a month, would you use them every week or would you be like me and I keep them all to the last couple of days just in case? <laughs> <laughs> it's like holidays. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. I, I have no idea. But I, where my head goes, this is going. So my daughter Harper's two and a half now. Um, like when she's, she can drive a car, what, 17 in Ireland. Will she ever actually own a car is, is where my head goes because everything's getting Uberized for want of a better word. Um, but like so car ownership, I don't know if, I don't know how that trend's going to play out. But yeah, I, don't, so- I don't know if she, like I personally, I think, She's going to she's gonna talk to Siri, who by then is like an extended family member, and, you know, ask for a car. And this uh, autonomous electric car will pull up outside, in she hops, 
off she goes. Never a boyfriend anywhere dream, near her. Dream on, <laughs> Jamie. You'll be like every other dad. You'll be doing the driving. No, no, no. But did, um, you know what I mean? Like, obviously, there'll be at some point where I'll have to <laughs> let go of her, right? Yeah. So I, I think what's really interesting in this space is a high profile corporate leader came out um, two or three years ago um, with a vested interest in the space and said autonomous cars is going to be the future yeah. um, all that. If you look at the World Economic Forum, they're predicting private car ownership will double uh, between now and 2050. Really? And now a lot of that will be driven by the developing world. But at the same time, we're not going to see, we are going to see a decline in private car ownership in the developed world. But we are still going, uh, households might not have two cars, but they will have one. You know, um, and maybe urban dwellers might, like if you're living in the city centre, mm. you mightn't, you might have the car share thing. But if you're living in suburbia, pretty much you're always going to own a car. Mm. Um, and, and that's what the experts without vested interests are saying. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's it, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and, 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 what, and what we pick up, it's very interesting, I'm sure you're seeing this. What we pick up a lot in the business discourse at the moment and in, in this era of kind of superstar tech owners is you pick up that soundbite from the from the celeb owner oh, yeah, and yeah. all of a sudden that becomes mainstream public discourse. And everybody says to me, oh, yeah, there's not going to be parking. Sure, I heard your boy saying X. And it's like, yeah, but there's also 99 other experts who will tell you why. He just has a higher profile, <laughs> you know. Um, Come here to me, we're going to have to change the subject because I did say we're going to be highly productive. And you are behind an organization called Unborough or Borra. 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 B O R R A D H. And uh, that has as its mission to try to make, how can I put this, Gaelic, uh, Irish language, uh, to make it more mainstream within business for bi good business reasons. Yeah, exactly. So I think what's very interesting. Um, being a relatively young Irish speaker um, at the moment is, um, I suppose, Irish is, the Irish language is, is undergoing a massive surge in popularity. Um, I think that probably you, you went to a Gael school a few years ago and when, when you were there, there was, there was probably two or three thousand people on the island being educated in the medium of Irish. That's now 60,000 people. And all those people are, are going and working somewhere. Um, and what you'll find is a lot of Gael schools are, are really good schools and, and a lot of people who were in Irish medium schools 15, 20 years ago now have really good jobs in, in some of the biggest companies in the world and they also just happen to, to love and, and speak this language. So what we're doing with Borough really is we're creating kind of like a chamber of commerce where these people can come together, they can learn from each other, collaborate with each other and they can do business with each other. So um, we've been on the go about six months. We're, we're doing events online at the moment, getting kind of 60, 70 people um, to, to each event. Uh, our next event is next Thursday at one o'clock. We have Martin O'Griefa, who's executive director of Aon in the UK. Um, he's going to be with us. Um, and yeah, no, it's, it's great and it's open for anyone who's interested in, in coming along and their Irish can be rusty, their Irish can be fluent, it can be whatever you want, but to just jump in at the deep end and, and I suppose learn how our native language can, can increase your connectivity and increase the opportunities for it your business. It is a network uh, and networking events are absolutely essential. The more I spend in business, the more... That's exactly where you meet your next customer, isn't it? Well, I think meeting customers is obviously important, but I think a lot of people, particularly in, in the current climate, for me, I learn from people. So a lot of the people I work with, they love listening to podcasts and they love reading business books. That doesn't really work for me. Like I, I have to get out and I have to chat to people and that's how I learn. I learn more in a five minute conversation than I would from reading a big tome about how some guy founded some business, you know. And um, so I think it's, it's all about getting out and some people, people might uh, get their next customer. Some people might get their next big idea. Some people might just get an opportunity to reconnect with a language that they love and, and that they don't get to, to do as, as often as possible. But ultimately, what we want to kind of show is that, you know, it's, the Irish language can open doors for businesses all around the world. And, and that's incredible that we have a small, um, we have, a, I suppose, a, a language on a, on a small island on the edge of Europe that can get you a foot into to companies in, in London, Melbourne, New York. You know? Some of the contacts are fantastic. Gary McGann, uh, formerly of Smurfit, would be one who's mad keen to have a chat at Skilk anytime you want. Yeah, There's also uh, yeah. the key slip down in, in the paddocks in Nace there. Uh, my dad, who, if we're uh, happy to speak to you. Okay. Uh, good That's great. Well, and actually, random rugby one, Luke Fitzgerald. Yeah. There you uh, go. Uh, uh. So, to toss you down. And uh, if anybody wants to join next Thursday uh, online, Borra, B O R R A D H. Dot I. And we'll find you. Yeah. Okay. 
It's all go like Chrissy Gno on thatgreatbusinessshow.com. This could be your ad on That Great Business Show. And a reminder that we still haven't given away the Cool Swan collection of bottles of the world's best cream liqueur. We'll give another two weeks just in time for Christmas uh, to get that done. To be in with a chance to win, just go to our Twitter account at Team GBS1. Like it, retweet it, telling your followers to subscribe to Ireland's best business podcast. Couldn't be simpler. And that's thanks to Mary Sadler, who joined us on that great business show. And here are a few That Great Business Show factoids that you may not have been aware of. Seaweed doesn't need fertilizer. Seaweed is the most sustainable plant in the world. Seaweed absorbs carbon dioxide and releases oxygen. Seaweed can grow three foot per day. But of course, you all know that seaweed can make great burgers. And that can also make a great business like Plant Ruption, headed by Jennifer O'Brien. Welcome to That Great Business Show, Jennifer. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Look at this. But before I get into the meat, (laughs) when I was checking out your CV, I was expecting to read that you were a PhD marine biologist or something. I know, I know. Nothing. No. Nothing like that. You have an accreditation, an SME credit. You're an ACCA, you have an MBA You've got so many pieces of paper, no, and none of them related <laughs> to seaweed. None of them related to seaweed. No. How come? Why seaweed? So, um, when I was a child, young adult, I suffered from chronic asthma, um, really, really bad asthma, weakened immune system on antibiotics every day, hospitalised, and I just really struggled to find a solution to, uh, you know, to manage those symptoms. Um, missed a lot of school education at that stage, so. Um, we had a holiday home down in Enniscrone in County Sligo where I took the seaweed bats um, and when I had the seaweed bats I just used to feel amazing after them for days on end I was absorbing all the nutrition and all the minerals and I just felt so good and it just my symptoms were completely under control during that time frame so it's kind of from that point that I started to learn the value of how sustainable and how amazing this plant could potentially be and always wondered why it wasn't more of a commodity in Ireland, why people hadn't caught on to this amazing plant, why are people... The reason that they haven't is because it's seaweed. Correct. Famine food, it was considered. Well, interesting, in Irish, Gaelia, it's actually called famine and it's nothing to do with famine. Yeah, But yeah. We, we have an association there with it, famine and famine, etc. So, yeah. sorry about that. That's okay. But you are making a business out yes. of seaweed and seaweed yeah. burgers, and you've already correct. made them and they are already in shops. That, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So, um, really where I suppose the business idea came out of um, was I uh, did an MBA program in 2018 and this we got an opportunity to do an entrepreneurial module on that program. Um, and one of the areas that we saw a trend, a potential business was the plant-based space, uh, the plant-based movement and protein alternatives. And that was massive and moving. Um, So I kind of wanted to come up with a solution of bringing seaweed, a a protein alternative, plant-based food kind of together and potentially making it a real business. Not knowing at the time it would be a real business, but just using that project time to potentially do the R&D for um, an option at the end of the MBA to go into. So it really, I think I learned a lot because I took for granted where my food was coming from. Not, I didn't take, I didn't know where my food was coming from. I never really, I just, I just didn't really dawn on me, you know, it just landed on my plate, meat and veg for day. And uh, like, I'm ashamed to say now, I didn't know where my food was coming from. And from doing that project and learning about factory farming and especially with COVID diseases that are coming from disturbing habitat, the illegal fishing that we, you know, depleting stocks at the moment. Um, I came really passionate about it. I wanted to kind of create a business from that. So I wanted to combine the the seaweed with the protein alternative. And plant-based seafood was where I could see the trend going. Um, so that's originally how it all kicked off and the idea and, and everything. Now, there is a problem because who owns seaweed? There's a huge area is, of yeah. legals around this. I you wouldn't bring that up. <laughs> well, oddly enough, my late father had an interest in oysters and he taught me a huge amount. And there were high court cases about yeah. the foreshore and yeah. who owns what. Exactly. Who, who owns seaweed? Yeah. So, I mean, there is such 
the licenses in Tabasco, you wouldn't even get into it. Um, it. It's a very topical area and especially everything that's happening in, in Bantry Bay at the moment and around the sustainability and the wild stock and, and what's coming out. So uh, really, I, to say who owns it is a very controversial thing, so I'm not going to get into that because I don't know enough about it. But um, at the moment, I have partnered with a strategic partner, Prani Rashigan, down on the west coast of Ireland in Sligo. And she's supplying me with the seaweed. For me to get a licence to harvest my own seaweed would mean conservation, um, you know, a lot of conservation work to be done and a lot of mapping and a lot of money to do that. And you'd have to grow it sustainably as well. And potentially that's an option we look at in the future, having our, Ireland's first seaweed farm because they don't exist yet commercially. Um, but at the moment, partnering with the strategic partnership was the way to really bring this plant into into the market, into distribution in Ireland. And does this lady have enough seaweed to make all of your burgers? She does. She has access to all stock down the street in Sligo. And she has, you know, potentially we may need to go to other suppliers. But for the moment, with the volumes that we're doing, she has access there. And she she's a great book out, the Irish Seaweed Kitchens as well. And she does fantastic work down there promoting the, the sea veg. So why, when you were doing your MBA... Um, I'm going to give a quick plug here because we because I'm doing the same one as yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, in just Trinity, started, you better say Trinity. In Trinity, <laughs> yes. I'm just starting out and um, we're, we're sharing a lot of them. Well, I'm explaining a lot of my pains that you went through as well. So uh, it sounds like it's not going to get any easier for me. <laughs> uh, but you never know. I might come out with an idea like this at the end of it. Um, why? I understand um, plant-based protein trend. I yeah. understand the sustainability trend when it comes mm. to fo- uh, food and traceability. Why did you go with seaweed, though? And yeah. then my my follow up question to that is: so we're familiar with things like Beyond Burger mm-hmm. and these sort of ones that try and make it very much like meat, meat that's not meat. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you've gone a slightly different direction uh, sure. with this, so um, can you explain? why you went that way as well. Yeah, exactly. And purely from exactly what Connell said, um, around it requires no fertiliser, no fresh water, no arable land, and it grows three feet a day. So it's the most sustainable plant on the planet. And we live on an island and we're not utilising it at the moment like we should be. So why, why aren't we? Um, it's down to the licensing issue, if, if that's one potential area. And there's also a perception, and this was, I'll talk later about the Food Academy programme, but um, there is a perception out there and I, I have heard customers say, see, wait, I'm not eating that. I have a sister who says the same. She's like, oh, it's disgusting. I'm not going to have that, you know. But the reality is that people don't know, aren't educated about how amazing, how nutritious it is and all, you know, it even contains vitamin B, uh, everything, you know, iron, fibre, and they uh, people just don't know. They see it as something that's washed up on the shore, that it's just a plant that's, that's they don't understand how beneficial it actually is. So that's why I chose it. And also it's great gelling agents as well. So it's ideal for plant-based alternative protein. Price point, where is it sitting versus uh, meat, real meat? Um, yeah, so costs at the moment are, are it sells, retails for 450 in super value. Um, I don't eat beef burgers these days, but I don't want you to pick up uh, a fatty for a two fatties would it be three or four euro, probably the same. Uh, like ideally, once we get some scale, we'll drive that price down, you know. How um, are you going to get that scale? So we're partnering with the manufacturer in uh, January. So at the moment, we're supplying 15 stores around Dublin, um, but we're capped at scale. We can't get scale with the level. Um, we're using Spade Enterprise Centre to create the product uh, manufactured there, but it's a small kitchen. We need scales. We need. We have a distributor and we need um, to partner with the manufacturer. So we're And will that manufacturing be done in Ireland? It will. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully. Do you want to tell us who you are going to um, manufacture with or maybe you don't? Uh, no, there's just a few parties that I'm talking to. No, there's a couple of dates happening. All right. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah. So I'm just working through a few kind of. And you've obviously uh-huh. done your your market research. So yeah. how big is this market? Uh, massive. Uh, the plant based market is expected to grow to 20 billion by 2025, and the seaweed market is expected to grow to 16 billion by 2025, and then yeah, the population overall population of the world is is yes, growing grow, yeah. rapidly so how are we going to feed the world sustainably um and that's that's my solution now this was originally my first product that was easy to get to the market it didn't require any technology didn't require any 
major input. But we are working with UCD from January on a, a new project um, that's going to use equipment that has much lower CO2 emissions and is much more nutritious. Uh, the food will end up being much more nutritious and it can change the texture through electric pulses. Um, so we're going to use that technology to create fish substitutes then from January and that's how we're going to go and create that scale. Made out of seaweed? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Whose yeah. brains has, you know, who, who, who owns all this technology and knowledge? Um, well, UCD would own the technology um, over the last this year. This is Nova, is it? Um, yeah, connected to Nova, more the food science kind of part okay. that they kind of merge. Um, last year, or sorry, this year, should I say, I've been on the, the New Frontiers program with Enterprise Ireland and I have amazing mentorship. And I've also been working with Hatch Blue, a VC, who invest in agriculture, fish farming, and invest in um, carbon companies that have a much lower carbon footprint. I've never come across them. Where are they based? They're an Irish company. Hatch. But Hatch Blue, yeah. But they be have offices in Hawaii and Singapore and Ireland, so they're Ooh, kind of based all over. Nice offices. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's nice locations. Yeah. And their accelerator program is there too. So, we'll see that. <laughs> um, so I've been working with them um, in a workshop for the last three weeks, and BIM as well, the Fishery Board, and they have helped me kind of realize my vision, where to go, and and given me some guidance around different technologies that I could potentially. So, I've quite, so, so is is your challenge? What would you say your biggest challenge there? Because what I see is changing people's habits or narrative around it. It's yeah. kind of like, you know, when you go to Asia yeah. and they're eating insects as like like normal. I know. I know. There's nothing. And I've had I've had the uh, cricket protein and all that. Yeah. Grand, right? Cricket bars. Lovely. Okay. Um, is, is that your challenge or is it? the different competitors in the marketplace like what are the what are like the big hurdles for you to get this I and think so, sorry yeah. a question yeah, sorry no I know I'm jumping in here with another question on terrible habit um, how come you're using distributors in this day and age and, and didn't go straight to consumer yeah good point good point um the, yeah, you're right. And the, the challenges, I thought, I was like, especially from people's perception of seaweed and, you know, how, we're not going to eat this. And a lot of people are still struggling to move to the, a plant-based diet. They're kind of maybe have meat-free days. They're flexitarians. They'd have food, uh, meat only a couple of days a week. But I was surprised when I I did some festivals and I chatted to people. And I had 50, 60-year-old men coming up asking for vegan burgers. I was like, what is going on? Why are they interested? And then, you know, it turns out a lot of men at that age have heart problems. And they've been told by their doctors to switch to a plant-based diet. So I was really blown away by the market uptake and how people were so interested. And I think people of, I suppose, our age group would be a lot easier to... To, you know, they try anything they wouldn't have, but there definitely will be some work needs to be done around the marketing of it to ensure that that everybody tries it and that the consumer shifts to to that space for sure. Are you aware of anybody else around the world who's doing something similar to you in with seaweed? Uh, yeah, there is there is a couple of companies, uh, particularly in the US, um, the New Waves, uh, the plant based seafood company. Now, there are, some of them have launched, and some of them are pre seed stage. They haven't launched yet. They've attracted uh, a good bit of funding um, in the states, but we will be one of the first movers in Ireland to do the plant based fish substitutes. That will be. I presume you'll be the first. Uh, there. There's yeah yeah. Tech. Hi, on this is there somebody else. <laughs> uh, there there is other. They haven't essentially launched yet. There's a lot of companies using kind of 3D printers oh, to, wow. and testing stages at this point. So. so so what would be your competitive advantage? And I still want to come back to that. Why <laughs> why you didn't go direct to consumer? Just I'm always yes, curious. Yeah, um, margins. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, well, first of all, it's a chilled product, so it's difficult for us to distribute directly to a consumer with EHO regulations, and and to have to, it wouldn't um, be financially viable for me to deliver um, products. Um, so a distributor can get that scale easy enough, um, but potentially if you have a, a frozen product or something that have really long shelf life for a couple of months, that you could directly you know, supply the, the consumer at that point. But for the moment, uh, with a chilled product, I think distribution is probably the, the best and what's, way. what's the edge for your company? Um, I think the edge is, 
Ireland um, and the Great A waters that we have and the seaweed that we have. And is seaweed um, different? Sorry, it's like uh, is seaweed different from <laughs> That's a good question. No. from like from east coast Asia. of Ireland to west coast of Ireland to America's seaweed versus? Would you eat the, would you eat the, sea, the seaweed at Sea Point? <laughs> is there seaweed at Sea Point? Uh-huh. I can't. There's a lot more than seaweed. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. So I, I mean. Give me yeah. Crash so course. the west of Ireland has grade A water for seaweed, and the ecosystem that's in the ocean at the moment, and all the salmon stocks that we have all working together, give us really high quality, nutritious seaweed. Not so sure for the east coast. <laughs> Different story there. Um, but yeah, I mean there are some suppliers starting. Uh, I know one person that I recently got a license to harvest in Wicklow, and Wexford will be the kind of first entry point. But tech, usually it's the west of Ireland that has that grade A water and that nutritious water. So today, Ireland, tomorrow, can you can you export or will you export? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I love how quickly she answered that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose we're, we're working with the New Frontiers Enterprise Ireland programme. And, and they'll only have you if you are going to. Exactly, so I have to say these, these <laughs> things, you know. I know, um, absolutely. I mean, we see the market initially as probably Northern Europe, um, Germany, uh, Holland, those kind of countries primarily. The States has a huge appetite for this. The States have already... Huge appetite. Yes, <laughs> <The blue. laughs> yes. Two quick questions. Go funding? Funding, yes. Do you have funding? Funding. Uh, we are in talks with a VP, a VCs at the moment and ideally at the end of New Frontiers. Uh, we have support from the Leos, of course. They've been fantastic. With feasibility grants. Which Leo are grants, you with? Dublin City. Um, and then after we go through the New Frontiers programme, we'll get introduced to Enterprise Ireland as a client and potentially there's the How much are you looking for? And, um, well, I'd like to manufacture in Ireland and create jobs in Ireland. Uh, that would be the goal. So, I mean, to manufacture in Ireland and to buy the technology and kit out a manufacturing unit, you'd be looking for a million euro realistically to do that. Um, potentially, we may need to outsource to Holland because the technology isn't here initially. Um, but that would be the goal, to create jobs in Ireland and and do the best we can. Final question. Plant Ruption is the company. Yes. Yeah. Great name. Where did it come from? Um, purely that we wanted to disrupt the market. So plant and then ruption is that we're kind of food tech that's going to disrupt the, the overall market. Um, so that's... That makes sense. Mm, the, makes yeah. sense to me. Yeah. And yeah. I'm going to give someone a crash course here for all our nutrition people. So per 100 grams. And this is amazing. You have... Like the top line, you only have 10 grams of carbohydrates, only 1.4 is sugar, which is really good. And your protein content, this is yeah, really surprising. Yeah, it's, really good. it's nearly 30 grams of protein. Yeah. In 100 grams? Yeah. That's not bad. That's unreal. Okay. <laughs> I think you've got a convert. I think so. <laughs> That's unreal. I'll tell you what you do, Jamie. Next week, come back and tell us, give us the... Jamie yeah. Reed on uh, the Irish Seaweed Burger. burger. We're doing some uh, goujons, our next product that Ooh. we're doing, uh, fish goujons. Yeah, they're coming to the market in January. And um, this, uh, yeah. You can there. see, though, this trend taking off because you, you go, just walk into your, your local supermarket now and you'll see that aisle of, or that section that is um, plant-based protein or, or non-meat, sure. meat, whatever you want to call it, the vegan section or the vegetarian section. The options there are growing and they're getting more and more yeah. space. Yeah. And it's yeah. it's definitely you look on Google search trends, it's it's something that is um increasing year on year. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I suppose we just need to find an option to, to to be more sustainable. Yeah. And it's not that it's don't eat meat and you know, I still eat meat occasionally. It's not it's not that it's it's just that we can't simply feed the world the way we're living at the moment. Jennifer O'Brien of Plant Ruption. If anybody wants to give you a million euro, they will find you at Plant Ruption. <laughs> One million euro. Well, they are out there and uh, some they people are. want to do that. So uh, yeah. she, you will find Jennifer at, where will they find you? Uh, yeah, we have a new website launching next week. Uh, the usual social network, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. So. Okay, thank you, Jennifer um, O'Brien there. Thank you so much Thanks for joining so us on having. That Great Business Show. Now, that is it from episode nine of That Great Business Show. Thanks as usual to our super sound engineer, Alison O'Dwyer, master editor, Peter Rice, both of Dublin South FM podcast studios. As I always say, they make us sound sensible. No, 
better? Yes. That's uh, also a big thanks to the sponsor, De Facto Shaving Solution. Buy it online at defactoshave.com. The runaway winner of our team GBS Helper of the Week is Kate Clark of Ugo.me that we featured on that great business show. She keeps suggesting great women in business for us to feature. So a big thank you to uh, Kate there. And if you know of a business that should be on Ireland's Best Business Podcast, go to our website, thatgreatbusinessshow.com and at the very bottom of the page where you will see Share Your Story. And you'll find, here he comes, hang on a second, let me just finish here. You'll find the kinds of businesses that we are looking for there. Always interesting, always fun. Speaking of fun, Jamie, your final word. Um, just for anyone listening in and you heard the vibrate in the background, again, that was Connell's phone that he didn't put on silent. He did put on for, silent, for, actually. For the second week in a row, was it? <laughs> but we 